Hey, what's up, folks? Welcome back to On Texas Football. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers, joined by fellow Lifetime Longhorn, the young prodigy C.J. Vogel, and we're here for our game week breakdown. That's right, actually talking about a game week opponent, the first one of the season, the Colorado State Rams, and this is a really, really compelling matchup, I think, for the Texas defense. Now, we'll get into both sides of the ball, but I want to talk about first the Colorado State offense versus that Texas defense. Uh, that is their identity. They're going to run the air raid. They're going to throw it 40 to 45 times. Uh, it's going to be a real test for that Texas secondary. So we'll start off talking about it and break down that matchup. But first, uh, let's thank our sponsor for our uh, breakdown, our game week breakdown here, uh, Underdog Fantasy. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, get in the game. Football season is finally here. Underdog Fantasy is a skill-based Real money, daily fantasy sports game. How does it work? It's simple. It's easy. Just download the Underdog app or go online. It takes almost no time. It's really, really simple and really quick. If I want, I can make my picks, submit everything in less than 60 seconds. Or I can take all the time I want, dig deeper. You know, I like to go down the rabbit hole to make those additional picks. Underdog adds a ton of excitement to your sports viewing experience. You can watch your progress update in real time. And today, folks, Underdog is hooking us up for the opening weekend for Longhorn football. Go to underdogfantasy.com. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code on Texas for a 50% first deposit match up to $1,000 plus one free pick. That's right, folks. Up to a 50% first deposit match up to $1,000 plus one free pick. All you got to do is use the promo code on Texas. Underdog offers projections on any sport that you watch, especially football, and it adds tons of excitement to the experience, which is why I personally love it, and you will too. So check it out. Again, underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code on Texas for a 50% first deposit match up to $1,000 and one free pick. That's Underdog Fantasy, our choice and the choice for fantasy, uh, daily fantasy as well. And remember, use the promo code on Texas to claim that 50% match up to $1,000 and a free pick. Thank you very much to our friends over at Underdog Fantasy uh, for sponsoring our game week breakdown. All right, let's dive into it. Let's start off talking about this passing game for Colorado State because that's the most dangerous element of this team. Uh, they're a top 20 passing attack uh, in terms of pass attempts and also top 15 in pass attempts. They're running the air raid offense. Brayden Fowler, Nicolosi, bit of a gunslinger mentality, 22 touchdowns, 16 interceptions last year. Uh, but he went going to Torrey Horton, who, by the way, is an NFL caliber wide receiver. He will be drafted pretty high in the NFL draft. Uh, he's a guy that probably can play on the Texas roster right now. He's that good. Uh, one of the top 10 best wide receivers in the country, easy. And he's a guy that's uh, been a back-to-back uh, -back thousand yard receiver for Colorado State. As a matter of fact, I'll give you this factoid, CJ. Um, over the last two years, only three receivers have more receiving yards than Torrey Horton. That's how productive he is. And those guys are Romo Dunze, Malik Neighbors, and Marvin Harrison Jr. So the conundrum for Texas, how do you take Torrey Horton and neutralize him, take him out of the game, and force Braden Fowler and Nicolosi to beat you with any of those other targets? That has to be the key for Texas. And I know that – uh, the big question coming in is, will that secondary be up to standard coming in after kind of a, a strugglish, you know, 2023 year? Well, they're going to be tested this week, I think, when you look at not just Torrey Horton, but Dylan Goffney out of the slot and a familiar name, Armani Winfield, who was once committed to Texas before decommitting in the middle of, I believe, the Oklahoma State game, uh, you know, way back at home in Austin. So some familiar faces there, but three talented wide receivers. The head of the dragon, obviously, is Torrey Horton. And what Texas will need to do is key in on when it looks like they're going to go to him, right? And what do I mean by that? Those design plays to get your guy open. Texas did a great job a year ago with Xavier Worthy and Jatavian Sanders kind of scheming those guys open, whether it be through, uh, you know, mesh concepts, whether it be through misdirection, some, some rub routes, whatever it might be, there has to be eyes on Torrey Horton at all times. And what was interesting is going through where he had a lot of his success rod, it was in that short to intermediate route range, right? Yep. You know, he's he has the ability to go deep. I'm not saying that he won't be a guy that they target down the field. But when you look at it a year ago, more than half of his targets came between that zero to 10 yard range for Colorado State. In fact, almost 80, 80 of his 120 targets a year ago came within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. So 
that tells me that they just want to get the ball in his hands and let him work after that, right? In those receptions below 10 yards down the field, he had a, a total of 500 or 660 yards, Rod. Mm -hmm. You know how many of those came after the catch? What? A whole lot of them, about 430. Yeah. So yeah. that's two thirds of his yards that he had behind or inside that first down marker came after the catch. That's all that's telling me is they want to get the ball to him and let him work down the field after that. Let him use his skills. Similarly to how Texas will kind of utilize a Silas Bolden or a Jaden Blue, just get the ball to him and let them use their speed and playmaking ability to get the ball down the field. That's how Texas needs to uh, prepare for this game. And the one thing that gives me a little bit of confidence here is what Michael Taft said, right? Yeah, this offseason we're working as, as a safety, as a defensive back unit, just get the ball carrier on the ground, right? Yep. They're going to catch the ball. It's a game of football. We're going to allow receptions. What we can allow is that first play to, to be broken, that tackle to be broken, and then obviously you create those yards after catch as a result, and you let a 10-yard play turn into a 20 or a 30 or a touchdown yard play, right? You can't allow that, especially in the SEC when you're going to be going up later in the year against uh, you know, guys like Barry and Brown and, and Moose mm -hmm. Muhammad. You know, some, some of these guys in which you know they have that home run ability. Well, you're getting a great test at this right now. Uh, I did want to mention one thing about Torrey Horton. They do throw it to him deep every now and then, right? He had 12 targets a year ago, uh, down beyond 20 yards down the field. They don't have much success when doing that. They only completed four of those passes, and four of those other passes were actually picked off. So if you're hitting at a 33% rate down the field when targeting him, but four of those passes are, are intercepted, I think you're going to take that 100% of the time if you're Texas. Of course, that hit rate for interceptions – We'll take it. We'll talk a little bit more about Braden Fowler and Nicolosi's passing chart in general. But right now, it has to be keep it all underneath. Death by a million first downs, if you will, because I don't think they'll have that in them this weekend. Just eliminate the long catch after, or yards after catch opportunities for Colorado State and keep it in front of you. Yep, I totally agree with you. And that's a great breakdown about... Uh, really the where Torrey Horton does his damage because he is a yak daddy. I think 11th most uh, yak yards, I believe, in college football. So he does a lot of great damage after the catch. And that's why he's really good in punt returns. So my strategy, honestly, would be I think Texas should try to play more bump and run coverage against him. Now, the stats would show that most of the time he's out wide. I believe it's, you know, oh, 75 plus percent of the time, somewhere around there, he's out wide. Very rarely they put him in a slot. I do believe to break tendency, they'll put him in a slot a little bit more. But when he's out wide, especially out there, I would have somebody playing bump and run coverage on him. Take away the easy completions and you can roll a safety over the top in case they want to throw it deep. But like you pointed out, they're not great at throwing it deep. I mean, I went and looked at their deep passing rate and you got, you're talking about a team that was 105th in the country in deep ball passing grade by a pro football focus. They're not great at throwing it deep, but they really do. Uh, they really do do a great job efficiently of throwing the football underneath to him. Yeah. Take it away. And Texas did a great job of this late in the season last year. They played bump and run coverage on the outside, on the field, and the boundary side a little bit more in the last three games against Texas Tech, against Oklahoma State, and against Washington. Now, Texas Tech, they shut down all the underneath stuff. So they, they did the same thing against Oklahoma State. They were three of nine on inside breaking routes uh, against Texas Tech because they were playing a lot of press coverage and really shut down that quick passing game. Now, Oklahoma State – the counter was they took Texas deep. So did Washington when Texas tried to play some bump and run coverage. I think against Torrey Horton, I would come down and take away the zero to nine yards. I would smother him there, force them to beat you in a 10 to 19 in that intermediate range. And here's why. Time to throw. Now, the reason that Colorado State is so good, they're really, really good. The reason that they are so good in pass protection is because of the system. Uh, his average time to throw is 2.6 seconds. When he's throwing to zero to nine yards, anything less than 10 yards, the average time to, to throw is 2.3 seconds. That's way too quick for you to get there. But how about this? When he has to throw the football to the intermediate area, 10 to 19 yards, average time to throw rises to 3.2 seconds. That's yeah. plenty of time for guys Absolutely. to get there. Now, the key to forcing him to get to deeper into the progression, to get to the extra layer of the passing game, is to take away the quick game. You have to take it away. If you give it to him, he's going to take it every time. Boom, boom, boom. And your pass rush will never get there. But if you can force him, hold on to the ball a little bit longer. Take away the quick game in the first read, which is usually going to be Torrey Horton trying to scheme him open. 
I think you force him to hold on to the ball, get to the second level of the passing game, get deeper into the progression. And that's when you actually, he holds on to the, when you take away the first read, when he's got to go to the intermediary, he holds on to the ball way too long. If you want to compare it to Quinn, Quinn in the intermediate area, his time to throw 2.6 seconds. That's, that's, that's in rhythm. When he's out of rhythm, which is when you force him out of the quick game, out of the short game, he holds on to the ball way too long. That's when you get home. But you got to play bump and run to do that on Torrey Horton and some of those receivers to initially throw off the timing. That's what I would do. Put a safety over the top. And by the way, if you can't hold up man to man, all right, against Colorado State's other guys, not Torrey Horton, because I'd put a safety over the top of him and play bump and run. But if you can't hold up against Armani Winfield and Daphne one on one, then we got bigger issues anyway. And I need to know that now. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great point. Speaking of Goffney, Rod, 99% of his snaps a year ago came in the slot. So Jalen Gilbo, Jod A. Barron, even Wardell Mack, if they try to cycle him in at all at that nickel spot, they know who they're going to be lined up against right now, and that's going to be Dylan Goffney or Monty Winfield again. Kind of a longer strided, you know, deep ball mm-hmm. uh, threat, 6'2 and a half, 6'2 and some change uh, with that frame. He will be another deep ball opportunity guy for the Colorado State Rams. Uh, but the one thing that I, I want to touch on again here, Rod, Texas last year was the number one team in the country in third down stops, right? That third down per- percentage on per- preventing conversions, right? It was one of the biggest jumps that we had seen year after year in terms of Texas improving on a single statistic. It was, an, it was tremendous. One of the focal points and identities of that defense. Colorado State's not a bad third down team. They weren't last year. They were top 45 in the country, converting at 41 and a third uh, percent. They'll be tested. That'll be one other part of this matchup for Texas. Can they continue to be a great third down team? Because, again, that was a big component of the success that Texas had defensively a year ago was being able to get off the field, whether it be turnovers, whether it be third down stops. They'll be tested against Colorado State, maybe in a different realm, a, a, a different identity versus what they'll face against Michigan. Nonetheless, they'll be tested. Yep. Uh, and you're right about that. And they do it by being a pretty much a one-dimensional football team. I mean, this yeah. is a team that's bottom 20 in the country in, in rushing yards and yards per carry. So they're they're not a really good rushing team. I don't expect them to have success running the ball against Texas. And you, you brought up something about the slot. And this is another way I think they're going to break tendency. And I know you want to get into the deep ball a little bit before we uh, jump to the defensive side of things uh, for Colorado State. Dylan Horton doesn't play in the slot a lot, but when he's in the slot, guys, he is deadly. How about this? So this is a random stat. So his yards per route run versus man versus zones around 2.7, 2.8. When he's in the slot and he's only in the slot, like I said, 20, 20, between 20 and 25% of the time, he's not in there very often. His average yards per route run is 4.18. The the pro football focus college football record for yards per route run from a receiver in the slot is set by Devontae Smith when Sark was the architect at Alabama offense when he won the Heisman. That was 4.96. He's at 4.18. He in the slot, he does a lot of damage. 10 of his like 21 forced missed tackles also came in the slot. That's a, that's a way for them to break tendency. If Texas is taking him away when he's isolated on outside, they can move him inside, give him a little bit more room to work. And honestly, that's where he does his best work is in the slot in that short to intermediate area. So watch that as a tendency breaker, them using him in the slot way more than we've ever seen it in any game because that could pay huge dividends for Colorado State. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, of course, getting to that kind of passing chart from Braden Fowler and Nicolosi, uh, you're going to see a lot of attempts deep, but you're not going to see much success, and you're going to see the ability for them to turn that ball over a whole lot. Uh, Listen, you look at what he throws over the middle of the field, Rod. If you if you have nine t- nine interceptions in between the numbers over the middle of the field, I'm looking at a Michael Taft and Andrew McCuba, Derek Williams having the opportunities to in this game on Saturday to really impact the game, right? To get that turnover, to get that ball on the ground, find a way to create a negative explosive play for that defense. But also look at the right side. He was four of twenty five passing the ball to the right side of the field beyond twenty yards. That's horrible and I know that there's some jokes in the NFL you know you might hear about it with Mitch Trubisky not being able to throw left well if that's the case and teams know this coming into the game what are, what's the game plan going to be hey you can sag off a little bit on that side of the ball we know yeah. that for whatever reason he's just going to be a little bit errant 
Well, deep right last year was a big issue for Braden Fowler, Nicolosi. Four of 25 beyond 20 yards down the field. If that's where they're taking their shots, I'm going to feel good about Texas finding ways to, to get that ball on the ground and prevent completions, whereas over the middle of the field, where you see the most interception-prone passes from Braden Fowler and Nicolosi, that's where Texas will come away with a turnover. I like it. That's good. That's money. And I do think they're going to try to test Texas deep. Why wouldn't you? If you watch the spring game and Texas defend the deep ball in the spring game, they were poor at defending it against Washington. Texas was poor at defending the deep ball. I think they were six of eight on deep passes. Even against Oklahoma State, Texas was uh, subpar against defending the deep ball. Uh, Oklahoma yeah. State was three of seven on deep balls. So I, if you're if you're Colorado State, you got to test Texas deep a little bit. And I like what you said there. If you're Texas, you got to know that and almost force him to, to to beat you deep where he is basically been the most careless as a football player. Uh, so I, I think, by the way, the last three games of the season, they threw it deep, um, uh, like 23 times they threw it, they started throwing it deep. The rate of their frequency of the deep ball started to increase, uh, later on in the season. So maybe they'll test Texas with that deep ball. Also watch out for deflected passes because the D line, if the time to throw is a little too quick and they can't get home, they're going to be told to get their hands up. Remember, Alfred Collins scores in the spring game doing the exact same thing to Quinn Ewers in the RPO game and scored a big man touchdown deflecting the pass. Watch deflection should have a lot of those in this matchup. All right, let's jump to the uh, defensive side of things for Colorado State. And I got to tell you, ultimately, I'm unimpressed with their front. They're going to be on the front inexperienced and undersized pretty much on the front. Uh, if you're going to look at it, Three of their six starters on the front between their D-line and also their off-ball linebackers. Uh, you got 36 starts between that group. And there are three of them, three of the six, with zero starts in their career so far. Uh, in the, yeah. If you go look at the back five, you go look at that defensive backfield, including nickel, 81 starts between that group. 81 starts, including two studs at safety who are all conference caliber players in Jack Howe, who is, you know, Jack Howe's a legacy actually there. His dad was a, um, you go look at his dad was a three-year starter at, um, at Colorado State, and he has been an all-conference player at Colorado State as well. Uh, his dad, he's a, he was a team captain, so he, it means a lot to him. Henry Blackburn. Uh, another really good player, led the team in interceptions last year at safety. What I think you get with experienced safeties, uh, CJ, is I think you get the ability to disguise coverages um, and manipulate uh, the pre-snap disguise. And against Quinn, that could be something that's advantageous to Colorado State. Yeah, I think so. And that's going to have to be kind of the key there, right? Because when you look at what's up front, and we've talked about it all offseason for Texas, is we expect that edge room to complement that secondary. You're expected to see an increase in production and efficiency against the deep pass for the Texas defense because of that pass rush. Colorado State's playing from behind a little bit this year with that pass rush, right? Mm -hmm. They lost Muhammad Kamara, one of their best players, one of the best players that has come through that program in quite some time. He was the heart and soul of that defense a year ago. He had a tremendous season in 2023, ended up, I believe, on the Miami Dolphins or uh, the Detroit Lions, one of those two teams. Heck of a football player. Uh, listen to this, Rob, 13 sacks, 17 tackles for a loss. Ooh. Good wow. football player. Uh, and then the other guy that they had that really could provide some sort of – you know, threat for the Texas offense was Noor Gatkuth. I'm probably butchering that name, but 53 tackles, <laughs> six and a half for loss. He's yeah. out. Jay Norvell said that he will not be playing this week for Whoa. Colorado State against Texas. So that's interesting of note because, again, you look at what Texas is returning on the edge room and you're thinking, yeah, of course, they're going to make that leap from 23 to 24, right? That's how that goes. Guys mm -hmm. develop, they get better, they improve. Well, when those guys that were kind of the, the, the best part of your defense a year ago are no longer on your team, that leads a lot of questions. So yeah. will that offensive line that Texas cycles through pretty often on Saturday be able to give Quinn Ewers time and protection? Right now, my expectation is absolutely. And I think that they'll be able to do so throughout the majority of this game. Of course, the heat may come into play. But, you know, make, until we see it, I have to imagine that that heat plays an advantage for the Longhorns having practiced in there for the last eight months as well. So I, I think right now you're going to see Colorado State struggle to get pressure on Quinn Ewers, and that should be a big sigh of relief for Texas because what have we heard all year? This offensive line wants to win the Joe Moore Award. This would yep. be a tremendous start to that campaign if they come out with a scoreless sheet 
against Colorado State. Yeah, uh, undersized. Your two DNs are at 250 and 245. You do have uh, two 300 pound D tackles, but the guys behind them are both 280. Uh, so they're undersized, inexperienced. I think the Texas front, Texas offensive line should have their way with that front. Uh, and also uh, Chase Wilson, name to keep an eye on. Really good linebacker. They're very productive. 107 tackles last season. Uh, so that's a guy also that can make some plays for them. Special teams, I'll just give you these names really quickly. Uh, Patty Turner, uh, he punted uh, last season average of 43.3 punt, uh, 43.3 yards per punt. And uh, basically he, he's, he's one of those guys that, He's a graduate student, but man, he really can put the ball where they need where they need it to be. So he's a bit of a weapon for them. Uh, consistently can put the ball deep in opposing territory. Uh, also, keep in mind that Tory Horton, the young man that we talked about at the wide receiver position, yeah. um, he is a fantastic return man for them, um, and he's a one of their best punt return. He's the, one of the best punt returns in the country, I should say. So he's going also be a guy that you want to watch on special teams. They also have Jordan uh, Noyes. I'm, I might have. Uh, butchered that name on the kicking side. Uh, he went 29 of 29 and extra points, 15 of 19 in field goals in 2023. Um, so he'll be another contributor on special teams for them. All right, yeah, I got two last notes here, Rod, what? and they both involve the secondary for Colorado State. First, leading tackler. You never want your leading tackler to be on that third line of defense for your Very defense. True. However, that's exactly what the case was a year ago for Colorado State. And we've talked about it. Two of their more impactful front seven guys no longer with this team, at least for week one, right? You know, Kamara's in the NFL, uh, Getkuth not healthy for week one. If that's the case, I'm looking at Jack Howell as the end-all, be-all again. That's kind of last line of defense for Colorado State. He's a, a, a tremendous safety that they have right now. But if he's your leading tackler, Texas should be able to run all over that front seven. Texas should be able to complete some passes with that secondary, with everything that he's asked to do. The other thing, and here's a line that you should be looking for if you're a Texas fan. Colorado State was 0-5 a year ago when allowing 280 or more passing yards from their opponent. So do we expect Quinn to throw for 300? Well, I think that question might be uh, how quickly can he get to that number, right? Does he get out yeah. strong? Do they score often? Is he in that game long enough to hit 300? Maybe, maybe that's worth asking. But I do know Arch Manning, if he does come into this game at any point, will be tasked with throwing the football, will be tasked with getting up to speed with the game of college football and getting those live in-game reps should anything happen to Quinn Ewers. Because as we've seen the last two years, something has. you got to get Arch ready. He will be throwing the football if he comes in. Texas throws for more than 300 yards. Texas gets the win, and I think it will be pretty big. It will stretch late due to that heat, due to those bodies and depth that Texas has in Colorado State. Just doesn't right now. Um, I, I I like that secondary of theirs. I think that's the strength of the defense. Um, that the question is, uh, how strong is that strength for them going up against Texas and that lethal passing attack with all those weapons? Because I think if you're if, like this, if the timing and the precision of Quinn and the wide receivers is off, those safeties who have seen a lot of route combinations, they've seen a lot of passing games. So they, they're, they're pretty sophisticated in their knowledge of passing concepts because they got like 40 to 50 starts in between them. So they'll know where to be. If the timing is off, the ball's a little late, or the ball's a little, you know, it, it's off and the ball placement, the receiver says depth uh, is, and the routes is off, there's chance for there to be mistakes and balls to go awry and these safeties to play a huge role in kind of the chess match within the game with Quinn. So the timing and the precision better be right on the routes. Otherwise, I think these safeties could really make some plays on the football. Uh, so good stuff there. Good stuff there, CJ. All right, uh, before we get out of here, uh, let's thank our sponsor once again, our good friends over at Underdog Fantasy. Get in the game, ladies and gentlemen. Football season is here. Underdog Fantasy is a skill-based, real-money, daily fantasy sports game. How does it work? Well, it's simple. It's easy. Just download the Underdog app or go online. It takes almost no time at all. Uh, if I want, I can make my picks in a minute or, or less, <laughs> or I can uh, take all the time I want. You can dig deeper. You can go down the rabbit hole if you want and make those additional picks, but Underdog at a ton of excitement to your sports viewing experience. You can watch your progress update real time, which is really fun and really cool. And today, Underdog is hooking us up for the opening weekend for Texas football. Go to Underdog Fantasy.
OnTexasFantasy.com. Use the promo code OnTexas for a 50% first deposit match up to $1,000 plus one free pick. Underdog offers projections on any sport that you watch, especially football, and it adds tons of excitement to the experience, which is personally why I love it, and you will too. Underdog Fantasy, folks. Again, that's UnderdogFantasy.com. Use the promo code OnTexas for a 50% first deposit match up to one thousand dollars and one free pick that's underdog fantasy our choice and the choice for daily fantasy and remember use the promo code on texas to claim that 50 percent match up to one thousand dollars and a free pick thank you very much to underdog fantasy and thank you to my man cj vogel for all of the tidbits of information thank you guys for watching thank you guys hello uh, rod this- i got a oh, i got a question for you you got another one what's up you got it uh, we got to end this with a score prediction do you got one oh. in mind i have one if you need a minute uh, I can throw it out there. Um, uh, I'll go with 40, let's go with 45, ooh, 45, 13. I like that. I'm not too far off. 45, 13. Yeah. I'm at 48 to 10. So we're in the same range. Texas okay. covered the, you got them covering. I don't, that means I don't have them covering. I just noticed they're else, right? Ooh, Cause they, ooh. what's the number? 33? 32 and a half. So you're right on the dot. I'm right on the day. <laughs> There you go. Oh, Rod works for Vegas, it appears. <laughs> uh, on top of that, Texas also just announced as we were recording that tomorrow or Saturday's game will be sold out. Of course, I'm not sure anybody was doubting that. Everybody's yeah. excited for this week coming up. Of course, the SEC move expectations are sky high for Texas. Rod, we expect Texas to win. Win pretty big. Should be a yes, good sir. game. Hope everybody uh, stays cool out there on Saturday afternoon. Yeah, we're all supposed to get uh, cooler temperatures. I think it's gonna be low nineties. Hey, and for Texas, that's a that's a that feels like a breeze. Yeah, <laughs> uh, all right, thanks, thanks, CJ. Great job as always. Uh, thanks to Matthew behind the scenes for hooking us up. He's a real MVP. And thank you to our friends over at Underdog Fantasy. And join us next week uh, for another game week breakdown of ooh, Michigan. Uh, don't want to look ahead, but that one got me excited just thinking about it. All right, until next time, guys. Look at horns. <laughs>